There's no denying that the 90s were filled to the brim with countless classic horror flicks. Amongst them, many were underrated thrills that unquestionably deserved way more recognition when released, but sadly failed to find a core audience at their time. Well, this brings us to the main content of today's video, where we will take a look at 13 great, unheralded horror movies from the 90s. Mind you, these movies aren't ranked in any order, and each has this sense of ingenuity in them, leaving an indelible mark on the genre. Without further ado, let's take a look at this slew of ultra-hidden horror gems from the 90s. But before we get into our explanation, we do have one very small request. If you enjoy our content, then please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Now let's begin. <laughs> the Resurrected, 1991. Dan O'Bannon's The Resurrected, also known as The Ancestor and Shatterbrain, irrefutably happens to be the best screen adaptation of Lovecraft's short horror novel, The Case of Charles Dexter Ward. Backed by a decent screenplay by Brent V. Friedman, the narrative has the wife of an esteemed Rhode Island chemical engineer enlisting the help of a private investigator to find out what her husband has been up to in an isolated farmhouse that has been owned by his ancestral family for centuries now. Well, here's something that you don't get to see these days, a horror film that is genuinely scary. What works wonders in favor of the resurrection is the sole fact that the movie categorically remains faithful to Lovecraft's novel. O'Bannon deliberately refrained himself from any tinkering. This meant Lovecraft's creativity was kept intact, and the result was a perfect horror experience. Not only did O'Bannon effectively keep the mystery bubbling with his inventive direction, but the special effects on display also deserve a mention here. Besides being excellent for their time, it's also through the eye-popping special effects that we managed to get a peek into O'Bannon's twisted imagination imagination with abominations. There's plenty of blood and guts, and we mean the latter in the literal sense. The flick is also quite atmospheric, with Richard Band's fantastic musical score in the background. Those who have seen The Resurrected will agree with us when we address it as a hidden gem, and to those who haven't, we sincerely suggest that you give this a watch at your earliest. Jacob's Ladder, 1990 Adrian Lin's psychological horror movie has a Vietnam veteran suffering from a severe case of dissociation. As he continues to get bedeviled by increasingly disturbing visions and the strangest of hallucinations, he desperately tries to keep a grip on his sanity, pushing through the haze of his post-traumatic stress disorder. With Jacob's Ladder, Lin achieved a masterstroke in an absolutely new genre for him. Based on an outstanding screenplay by Bruce Joel Rubin, Jacob's Ladder is a movie that's powerfully written, directed, and acted. Believe us when we tell you that actor Tim Robbins was not the English director's first choice for the role of Jacob Singer. It was Tom Hanks. And boy, aren't we glad that Hanks turned down the film and the role was eventually passed on to Robbins, who, may we add, was absolutely fantastic. One of the primary things that make this slick, riveting, and viscerally scary flick stand out from the crowd is the fact that when you watch this movie here, you simply don't watch Watch it, you feel the film too. It has this surrealistic horror atmosphere, with a particular nightmarish hospital sequence that can easily be regarded as one of the most terrifying moments that the 90s horror cinema has ever had on display. Right from the brilliance of the progression of the engrossing storyline, the unforeseen twists and turns, and the nerve-shattering final explanation, what is there not to like about this movie here? Bad Moon, 1996. Based on Wayne Smith's novel Thor, Eric Red's Canadian-American horror film revolves around Ted, a photojournalist who gets bitten by a werewolf during one of his work expeditions. Seeking isolation and a cure, Ted moves into a trailer in the woods. In due course, he's paid a visit by his sister and nephew, who eventually ask him to move in with them. Ted declines initially, only to accept the invitation later, but by then he has turned into a werewolf. As Ted attempts to reverse his condition by finding a cure for his disease, he becomes hostile towards his family, and it's up to the family dog Thor to protect them from the imminent danger and save the day. Red's Bad Moon has hands down the creepiest looking werewolf on display, one that doesn't only look intimidating, but is also quite physically imposing. Bad Moon isn't just a severely undervalued werewolf movie, it's a hidden treasure, especially if you address yourself as a werewolf and horror movie buff. Brownie points to you if you happen to be a dog lover, or in other words, a German Shepherd to be more precise, because this movie certainly has the dog stealing the limelight. From exceptionally well-written characters to well-directed actors, there's plenty of graphical violence to keep fans of the genre highly satisfied. 
Ted's transformation into a rapacious werewolf is bound to keep one at the edge of their seat, and the gory visuals of the werewolf tearing people up, literally limb from limb, is nothing but a sheer treat for every genre fan out there. Hardware, 1990. Richard Stanley's feature directorial debut is a brushed aside sci-fi horror gem that certainly deserves your time. Starring Dylan McDermott, Stacey Travis, and John Lynch in the leading roles, the plot follows a nomadic scavenger coming across a buried robot while trekking through a radioactive wasteland. He takes all the pieces and goes to a junk dealer. Hard Mo Baxter, a former soldier, buys the robotic head as a Christmas present for his metal sculptor girlfriend Jill. A delighted Jill decides to use the head for one of her sculptures, unaware that the robot is a military cyborg, built to control the severe overpopulation crisis. Naturally, pandemonium breaks when the robotic head self-activates by draining Jill's apartment's power network and starts to reassemble itself, targeting Jill primarily for extermination. Based on a short story called Shock by Steve McManus and Kevin O'Neill, this British science fiction horror film is spectacular in terms of its cinematography, lighting, and background score. The reddish-orange atmosphere in particular feels almost unearthly, setting the perfect tone of a post-apocalyptic world with a robot gone wild theme. While the pacing of the movie is praiseworthy, you're going to love the slow buildup. Also, Hardware has celebrated musicians like Carl McCoy, Iggy Pop, and Lemmy making cameos. Remember the nomad who discovered the robot? That was Carl McCoy in his best disguise. If you love a dystopian science fiction horror, please do give this a shot. Ravenous, 1999. Antonia Bird's horror western cannibal movie has Captain John Boyd reassigned to the remote military outpost of Fort Spencer by his commanding officer, General Slauson. Located on the west side of the Sierra Nevada, Fort Spencer, which is primarily used as a way station for those traversing the mountains, is staffed by a motley array of misfits. However, things take a dark turn after the arrival of a frostbitten stranger named Colquhoun, who tells the crew the hellish tale about his party leader, Colonel Ives, and how the latter resorted to cannibalism upon being lost and trapped by snow for three months. The screenplay by Ted Griffin makes Ravenous a brilliant blend of horror and black comedy. Now when we say horror, we're literally referring to gruesome levels of gross-out gore and cannibalism in particular. The wonderfully frightening background score by Michael Neiman and Damon Albarn, along with Anthony B. Richmond's stunning cinematography work, makes the movie all the more atmospheric. Bird's inventive direction makes this film a rare treat, one that is certainly not for the squeamish, and it is the compelling nature of the narrative that keeps the viewer's eyes locked onto the screen all throughout the runtime. Ravenous has a solid cast, Guy Pearce and Robert Carlyle are phenomenal, and the dynamic between the duo is epic. Tales from the Crypt presents Demon Knight 1995. Ernest Dickerson's horror comedy flick was initially a script that had been circulating in Hollywood for a couple of years. True, it wasn't exactly adapted from EC Comics and did lack the standard morality play, but the producers nonetheless decided that it had the right blend of horror and humor to be produced as a Tales from the Crypt spin-off film. Co-written by Mark Bishop, Ethan Reef, and Cyrus Voris. The narrative has drifter Frank Breaker getting into some accident and taking shelter in a decommissioned church. Trouble seems to follow Breaker as he is seen pursued by a demon known as the Collector, who has his own agenda to fulfill his devilish needs. If you call yourself a fan of the television show, you're bound to like Demon Knight then. There's just enough gore, humor, and over-the-top carnage in store for you. Actor Billy Zane undoubtedly steals the show as the Collector. Not only is he wickedly charming, but also delightfully evil. And those of us who have seen the movie will agree with us when we tell you that Zane did have a great time playing his part as the villain. Why else would he address Demon Knight as his personal favorite film? The movie has just the right blend of horror, comedy, and drama, and adds to this a great set of characters who you will literally warm up to. Dickerson has also done a marvelous job at directing this film. He has presented such an intriguing mythology and setup that the audience is always left to wonder who will survive and what will be left of them when they do. Give Demon Knight a definite shot for Zane and the kill sequences. You're bound to love both. You can read the letters now. Spur of Echoes, 1999. 
Written and directed by David Cape, this supernatural horror movie here is based on Richard Matheson's 1958 supernatural novel, also titled A Stir of Echoes. The plot follows telephone worker Tom Witzke, experiencing haunting visions of a girl's ghost after Tom lets his wife's sister hypnotize him. If you're wondering what's the best thing about this movie, there are two things. While the first one categorically happens to be Kevin Bacon and his versatility as an actor, the second one happens to be Zachary David Cope, who plays the role of Bacon's child in the movie. Can we add that both of them were absolutely brilliant in the film? Also a special mention to Cape for coming up with such a well thought out plot and then effectively fusing it with outright terror. Now comes the part why Stir of Echoes, despite being spectacular, was not recognized as such. Call it sheer bad luck, but M. Night Shyamalan's The Sixth Sense had just released a month before Stir of Echoes, and it is only fitting to say that Shyamalan had more than satisfied his viewers with the flick's strong supernatural theme. And because The Sixth Sense was such a blockbuster hit, Stir of Echoes upon its release did not get the recognition that it was truly deserving of, and the movie was shoved aside. <sighs> Oops. Well, I guess I better punt. The Dark Half, 1993. One fails to understand how The Dark Half could possibly be a failed horror movie that earned its cult classic status with time. Not only is this horror gem a great adaptation of Stephen King's 1989 horror novel, also titled The Dark Half, but it also happens to be both written and directed by a true horror movie icon, the one and only George A. Romero. That being said, let's take a peek into the narrative that basically revolves around best-selling murder mystery suspense thriller author Thad Beaumont. Apparently, Thad underwent surgery when he was a child to remove a tumor from his brain. But unbeknownst to Thad, the growth was the developing fetus of Thad's fraternal twin, who did not evolve beyond an eye, teeth, and fingernails. Years pass by, and Thad is a highly successful novelist who writes violent best-selling thriller books under the pseudonym George Stark. Upon being blackmailed by a reporter who seems to know the truth about George Stark, Thad publicly buries George Stark at a promotional event, only to find himself becoming the lead suspect in a string of gruesome murders that follow later. If you ask us, a partnership between King and Romero would literally have fans going completely mad, and to come to a realization that this film did not fare well upon its release makes us really feel bad. After all, The Dark Half is one of King's finest adaptations, and it certainly deserves far more credit than what was given to it during its release. In fact, you'll be surprised to learn that, as per Stephen King, the plot of the movie was part autobiographical, as it was inspired by the series of events that led King to disclose his own writing pseudonym, Richard Bachman. Everything is so perfect in this film, from the direction, writing, and acting to creating a genuinely creepy atmosphere. Also, actor Timothy Hutton is fabulous in his performance. He really does bring life to his dual character. We firmly believe there's no reason for you to miss out on this good horror thriller here. The Addiction, 1995. Abel Ferreira's vampire horror movie centers around an introverted New York graduation student named Kathleen, who's turned into a vampire after a woman pushes her into a stairwell, bites her neck, and drinks her blood. The attack has Kathleen literally struggling to come to terms with her new lifestyle and her insatiable cravings for human blood, of course. Backed by Nicholas St. John's intriguing philosophical screenplay and Ken Kelsey's drop-dead gorgeous black-and-white photography, The Addiction is often stated as one of the most original vampire movies to have ever been made, as it exhibits the real struggles and the mental mindset of a newbie vampire. Brownie points if you have an open mind, because if you do, then you have every reason to like this highly intelligent, low-budget, philosophical horror film. Lily Taylor is fascinating as the lead character here. She gives quite the haunting central performance as Kathleen, especially after her attack that involuntarily draws her into a world of violence and her addiction to human blood. Give this a definite shot! Don't let overhyped Hollywood productions keep you from seeing this entertaining horror gem here. No, she's not. Mirror Mirror, 1990. Marina Sargenti's supernatural horror flick, which is co-written by Yuri Zeltster. Sisters Annette and Gina Cascone, and Sargenti herself, revolves around Megan, a bullied, shy, teenage goth teen who strangely grows a liking to a mysterious antique large mirror in the house that she and her recently widowed mother have just moved into. Upon realizing that the mirror has the power to grant wishes, Megan starts harnessing them herself, oblivious to the fact that everything comes with a price. Initially titled The Black Glass Mirror Mirror, might come across to one as a laid-back teen drama, which, of course, takes a drastic turn, with Megan taking a turn for the worse. 
The movie is exceedingly atmospheric, and the whole idea of mirrors as portals for evil, and add to this, this one dripping blood too works massively in favor of this horror thriller. Mirror Mirror features a strong performance from a solid cast, good direction, and a bunch of memorable set pieces, one of which includes a nasty blistering shower sequence. Megan's transformation from an innocent girl to an evil murderer is simply remarkable. This movie is an excellent pick if you fancy Stephen King's Carrie. Body Bags 1993 well, with body bags, you're basically looking at three short stories. The first is about a serial killer, the next one is about a hair transplant gone terribly wrong, and the third one is about a baseball player who loses his right eye in a car accident, then receives a transplant and gets possessed by the personality of the eye's previous owner, who wasn't just a murderous killer, but also a necrophile. When you have the masters of horror, John Carpenter and Toby Hooper, not only directing but also acting in the stories, you know for a fact that things are going to be interesting. All three offerings are worth watching, each delightfully twisted in their own way. The first story, titled The Gas Station, even has cameos by Wes Craven and Sam Raimi. No wonder it's regarded as the most frightening of the three segments. The undeniable strong point of Body Bags is the all-star horror cast, and while it's true that none of the stories are what one would address as brilliant and mind-boggling, they are traditionally and enthusiastically made, and that's precisely what makes this horror comedy anthology television film a must-watch. Cure, 1997. Originally titled Evangelist, Kiyoshi Kurosawa's Japanese psychological horror movie centers on a Tokyo Metropolitan Police detective who's probing deeper into a series of brutal murders, where the letter X is carved into the very neck of each victim. The gruesome killings look like they have been committed by random perpetrators who have no recollection of what they've done. Kurosawa deliberately does not go into specifics of his plotline. While everything does look like it's coming together, it is Kurosawa just giving you the illusion of it, only to make it indefinable in the end. The pacing is deliberately kept slow, because Kurosawa wants his audience to be immersed in the impression that he creates. The direction is top-notch, the performance is solid, and the appallingly grisly murders on display will send shivers down the spine. Just roll together the genres of horror, crime, and thriller, and you have Cure right in front of you. The Pit and the Pendulum, 1991. Stuart Gordon's The Pit and the Pendulum is based on Edgar Allan Poe's famous 1842 short story, also of the same name. Set in the year 1492 in Toledo, Spain, the horror movie has Grand Inquisitor Torquemada wanting a baker's wife in his torture chamber for the Spanish Inquisition, accusing her of witchcraft. Believe us when we tell you that Gordon's original choice for the role of Torquemada was Peter O'Toole, and when that did not happen, it was passed on to Anthony Perkins. Of course, that did not happen either, and the role landed on Lance Henriksen, who, we may add, was absolutely brilliant. His character is someone who's both powerful and frightening, and it's only fair to state that Henriksen does complete justice to the role. Rona de Ricci as the baker's wife was spectacular too, and one often wonders why she did not pursue acting as a career after the movie. Now let's talk about the parts of why this film works. We'll begin with the story that it's based on, and while Poe's short story is a classic tale, Gordon does not take all of its influence from the short story. We have to give credits to Dennis Powley for the screenplay. Next come the impressive atmosphere and the settings. Be it the ancient castle, the torture chambers, or the costumes for that matter, they're all terrific. We agree there isn't much gore and violence, but there are some graphical scenes that show true horror. If you call yourself a fan of atmospheric horror, please do watch The Pit and the Pendulum. Marvelous Verdict Well that's all for today, and with this we finally come to the end of our video here. So which of the ones mentioned was your favorite back then? Also, did your favorite hidden horror gem from the 90s make it to our list? We would love to know your thoughts in the comments section down below, and we sincerely hope you've got your fill of horror for today. Now if you enjoy this video, you know what to do. Please do leave a thumbs up and stay tuned with us as we promise to come back with more exciting content. Till then, goodbye and thanks for watching! Have a nice one!